you have to understand control of money and how do we control money? How do we get back control? And I think the more that we do that kind of stuff, get control away from those corporations, that's powerful. It's the foundational piece where you start to take back control by being the bank. You'll recapture all the money, you'll recapture all the interest you're giving away, you'll plug the holes in the boat. This is not stuff that is taught in school. It's not taught in college. In fact, a lot of people out there that, that preach financial knowledge like financial advisors don't talk about this kind of stuff. What can we start doing to change this pattern, to change this tradition that we've just all have always done for our whole lives? How do we, as Chris said before, make that one change that changes everything? All right, what's going on, everybody? Another week, another wealth webinar and a special wealth webinar because not only is it the day of love, Valentine's Day, but we've got something extra special with our guest, Brian, and uh, pretty excited about this one. And the way that this whole webinar came together was uh, unique all in of itself. But I, think I just got done doing an interview. Uh, it was called the CEO 2024 Outlook. And, and what this is, is it's a, a report that they're putting together from 100 CEOs about what CEOs are looking for at the, the economy doing in 2024. And obviously most of you that are joining us here, and, and by the way, how many of you are here for the very first time, put I in the chat, just always trying to gauge the audience. You know, as we kind of climb over a hundred here, I just want to know how many of you are brand new to Wealth Webinar? This is your first time. Awesome. Well, clearly it's not Cashy's first time because he is just a regular on this show. But every time we do this, we've got lots of new folks, which is awesome. But in this economic report, one of the things that I talked a lot about is the coming months, the coming years, what lies ahead. You know, I think the news does a really good job of looking in the rearview mirror and focusing on, you know, how robust the economy's been in the last year or two years and how good the stock market's been doing. And Jim Cramer's always just saying, oh, invest in this and buy that and buy that. And guess what they do? They always lose. But anyway, that's just Jim Cramer. So in this report, one of the things that I made sure to highlight was that we've got some major headwinds coming in the economy. First, we got an election. We got wars brewing. We've got all sorts of things going on with our shipping lanes, which pulls in geopolitics. But the biggest thing for all of you that we've got happening is a little wee little bit of a problem with debt. Now, when I say debt, what do I mean? Well, I mean interest rates right now are pretty darn high. Actually, they're pretty normal but they're pretty high given what we just came out of. And, and secondly, I think one of the big things that I see coming is debt when it comes to commercial debt, companies and industries that took on massive amounts of debt because interest rates were really low. I mean, come on, who wouldn't have wanted to borrow in the last interest rate cycle? I mean, you could have gotten a five or 10 year line of credit or loan at two or 3%. And big companies probably even got lower rates than that. But you know, as they say, all good things must come to an end. And that's what's happening now. All those debts are starting to mature right now. 2024, 2025, and 2026, which means the CEO outlook moving forward is pretty darn dim. Because those debts, as they mature, that means a lot of these companies are going to go from paying 2 to 3% on these loans to now paying 6 7 and 8%. So that's just a little bit of pressure on Mr. Jerome Powell and all the kooky, I'm not going to swear, but you know, beep over at the Fed and what they're doing, because I don't even know if they know what they're doing, but that's, I guess, where we kick today off. And that's where Brian's going to kind of talk a little bit of, about some very interesting things. But I want you to remember the problems that lie ahead. And I want you to think about those problems, but I want you to most think about what do you do today to get ready for what should be the biggest opportunity of your life. All right, Stephen. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, you know, it's not something that just happened overnight. This is a culmination of many, many, many years and and decades of just wild, uh, what do they call it? modern monetary theory and, and the fractional reserve banking and some stuff we're going to get into today. And, you know, remember the United States economy is a massive ship and, and nothing happens quickly, but we're spending what, $7 trillion a year right now. We're $34 trillion in debt. 
making trillion dollar uh, annual interest payments. And it's just, that's out of control. And, and so there's not a lot of end in sight. And so, you know, a lot of what we teach is how to take back control of your money, which will allow you to weather some of these storms and some of these pullbacks and, and things throughout history that we've seen that we know are coming again. And at the end of the day, that's what it's all about is positioning ourselves, being educated and being ready for it. So uh, we're going to get into kind of some of that history and, and the beginnings of that today. And uh, who's going to lead us is one of our newest uh, BYOB money mentors on our team, a gentleman uh, named Brian Fouts, who, um, interestingly enough, I actually have known of Brian, uh, not known Brian, but known of Brian for many years. He actually purchased a company uh, called the Evolution Group uh, that I had been, uh, Evol Evolution, Evolution Group that I had been following for many years, a guy named Mike Dillard, and um, Brian took that over and and started putting out all kinds of financial education and content. And I'd always get his emails and always thought it was really good and, and really cool. And then uh, Devin connected us, you know, Brian reached out, wanted to start his own infinite banking policies, knows a lot about infinite banking, but had never been on the uh, insurance business side of the, the world. And so we connected and just kind of, you know, being Valentine's Day today, Brian, I don't know, I had some little hearts coming out of my, my eyes when I was talking with you. And I was like, this is awesome. So it was a great fit. And we said, um, so we, we figured it out and Brian said, listen, man, I'd love to, you know, come and join the Noggle team and the BYOB team and, you know, just really continue doing what I've been doing and just take it to the next level with you guys' support and systems and, and companies. And so it's it's uh it's been it's been a lot of fun working with Brian this year so far. We got a really lot, a lot of cool new things um coming up later this year. So just wanted to introduce him to the community today and uh, let him uh, teach a little bit uh, what he's good at. So Brian, really appreciate your time hopping on today, and um, this is going to be fun. Yeah, appreciate the opportunity to be here and to you know share this information. So I'll kind of give a quick kind of background because I don't have the same background as as Chris or Stephen. Um, I was programmed, as I call it, I was taught to do that traditional thing in life, came from the, the lower middle income family, was taught to go to school, try to get good grades. I tried <laughs> to say I actually did, got a degree in construction management and business and went into that career and did that for 13 years. I hated it. I literally hated that life. I had all the, the things that we all are told we should have, right? I had the, the car with the car loan. I had the house with the well, the brown picket fence, but it had a fence around it. You know, starting a family, had the 401k, had all that stuff. It was, it was, it was on the outside, it was great. Then along came 2008 and 9, and I lost half of everything. And it was really kind of interesting. I remember I looked back and said, Hey, I'm worth negative 40,000, some thousand dollars at that point in time. I'm like, I've worked 13 years, I'm worth a negative amount of money. And I said, This is not right. And if I keep working, I'm going to work till I'm 85 and I'm going to die. And nothing's going to ever change. So that kind of set me on a journey to go do something different. And I ended up leaving that career, going into real estate, started raising private investment funds, raised seven figures for other things, acquired the elevation, we did all that kind of stuff. But the one thing that I want to touch on today is that I didn't have knowledge. I was ignorant of a lot of things when it came to money. And when I started surrounding myself with people you know, like Chris and like Steven, I started to realize there's something else going on behind the scenes. And I didn't know what was going on. I didn't really understand money and how money worked. And, and I realized that that's what I dove into. And so what I want to touch on today is kind of the history of, of how we kind of got to where we're at today. Because when I started to uncover this kind of stuff, and I started talking about it, by the way, and teaching it, and I, I fell in love with it, but I realized that, my gosh, people do not have this knowledge. Now, obviously, Chris and, and Stephen have, they know this kind of stuff, and people on this call are going to uh, know this stuff. So I want to kind of start that dialogue and get some feedback on this. Now, this is a presentation, well, it's part of a presentation I did gosh, a couple of years ago, and it's just a section of it I want to talk about, but it it talks about what's kind of going on behind the scenes of, of how we got to where we're at today. Because for me, I like to know why. Like I understand what's going on today, but I, I want to understand why. Like, why is this happening? And you can go back to, by the way, Rome, one of the first civilizations, I guess you could look at, same thing. The same thing. There's patterns there. This is the question I started asking myself is what is going on behind the scenes? when it comes to money, when it comes to the economy, when it comes to wealth creation. So let's take a brief look at that right now. So here's the first realization that I had, especially when I was around successful, wealthy people. And that is that our money is not fully in our control, especially if we don't have the knowledge of how to work or use money. It's not in our control. And by the way, there's three things that I believe that we all should control in life. 
Mindset is one of them. Second one is time. Third one is money. Money is the tool though. It's a tool. The other two are kind of internal, but that's the other tool outside that I wish we all could understand how to control. So I realized that, that I'm not in control. The other thing I kind of started to realize is that wealth is transferring. It's always transferring though. And so you hear this, you hear these terms, the great wealth transfer, the great wealth transfer, all these kinds of things. But here's what I always thought. Oh, it's happening right now. It's happening this year or it's happening in the next three years. But what I started to understand, and uh, I think Chris alluded to this a little bit, it's been happening for over a hundred years, probably longer than that. I don't, you know, probably been happening for a lot longer than that, but wealth is always being transferred, but we're seeing it right now accelerating. It's happening faster and it's happening faster. And where's it coming from though? Where's it being transferred from and to whom? Well, obviously the middle class, because that's the one that's shrinking right now. Poor is growing. And what, what else is growing? Well, if you know what's, you have that knowledge, you can also be on the other side, the winning side. But the question I started asking myself is though, okay, well, great, but who is stealing it? And obviously the answer probably does not surprise us on this call. But what I was kind of, I kind of had this kind of opinion on it, that it's being perpetrated through fraud and force. And it's not an accident. And it's been happening for a long time. This is not like a five-year thing. It's not even a 10-year thing. It's a hundred-year thing, right? And so let's talk about the kind of the two major things or specific causes of it. Now, there's a lot more causes of this kind of stuff, but um, Chris already alluded to what one of those is, but we'll talk about that. But there's two major players in this. But first, kind of what has led to this? Now, these slides are a bit dated, but I'll, I'll go through them kind of fast because I think we're all kind of aware of what's going on right now. We have rapid rising costs. The home prices are going out of control right now, and it doesn't make sense. That's the kind of interesting thing. Rising home prices doesn't make sense for a lot of people right now with what's going on. You've got rising costs, you know, outpacing growth. That's happening right now. Look at education costs. That one's staggering. I remember when I, when I went to college, uh, what I paid then versus what I pay now, I, it makes no sense. Like I'm trying to like understand how it's gone up by, I think it's like um, 10x, I think, from when I went to college. Kind of dated myself there maybe a little bit, but it's just nuts. Um, the other thing that I kind of looked at too was when I was going through all this education for myself is the average retirement funds. And it's kind of a scary thing. Let's say if you want $50,000, okay, well, that means you need to have 25 times that in your fund, which is the 1.25 million. Yet, what's the reality for most people out there right now? It's a very scary reality. Like this is the average retirement savings by age, age 65, $209,000. And by the way, this is a, a little bit older, but that's very scary right there. That means that people cannot retire, probably because they're following that traditional path like I was. Oh, my 401k is going to be there when I need it, right? Yeah, you know, probably not. So that was one of the things that I kind of looked at. I was like, this is not good. This was me, by the way. This was me. In fact, I was um, I was age 30, and I think I had about $70,000. <clears> and I was, in, I, was, I was exactly where this thing shows I was at. This one is really scary. It's probably gone up. I don't know if it's gone up or not. Um, you know, maybe Chris or Steven, you might know this, but the number of homes dependent on the government is about 50%. So if you think of that in the population, 50% of people are relying upon the government to survive or to get by. What does that mean for them being able to actually retire or survive or even have a legacy, live the life they want? In fact, what that tells me right there is that when we talk about infinite banking, Half the population right there can't even do it because they're relying upon the government. And so that really kind of kicked, kicked me in the pants when I started to realize these kinds of things. I said, if I just rely upon the traditional path, the government, employers, all that kind of stuff, Wall Street, corporate America, I am screwed. I have got to get control. So that's kind of one of the big realizations that I personally had. But yeah, this is kind of a scary chart right there, to be honest. Um, household debt on the rise. I remember that was my big thing. I was getting more into debt every year when I was in my early 30s or 30 years old, I was getting more into debt every year. And I could, and I realized I would never get ahead. So that's kind of some of the current situations, but what are some of the two major causes of the current financial situation? So there's two I want to cover right now. And I, I never even knew about this stuff because this is not stuff that is taught in school. It's not taught in college. In fact, a lot of people out there that, that preach financial knowledge, like financial advisors, don't talk about this kind of stuff. And I know that we have some on the, on the call right now that are financial advisors or have been. <laughs> so the U.S. dollar turned into fiat currency. Most people know that that happened, but it wasn't like a simple process. And when I heard this, when I was younger and I heard this, I'm like, what does that mean? I, I didn't really know what it meant. So I wouldn't kind of found out. And I'll talk about what that means. What's the second one? Well, we talked about it. It's the practice of fractional reserve banking through the creation of the Federal Reserve or Central Bank. That is about control and power. That's in my opinion, but 
these two things have really contributed to where we're at today, in my opinion, from what I've looked at. Now, obviously, I'm, we're going high level here, but those are two things. There's a lot more than that, but those are two of the big ones that I look at. And obviously, I want to get some feedback from everybody and also Steven and Chris on this because this is just my own research and uh, what I've gone through. The question I always ask, though, is, well, why? Who perpetrated these two evil things? Well, the federal government, right? It's the federal government. And why would they do that? Anybody want to take a guess as to why the federal government wanted would want to do these kinds of things? It's because they, it's power and control. It's all in the name power and control because that's really what the government is trying to do. They want control. They want power. Yep, they're all, they are right there. That's what they want. And it's, it's, it's the same today as it was 100 years ago. Okay. So fiat money versus commodity money. This is kind of interesting when considering what we got going on right now with the, the dollar and digital currencies and all these talks about uh, you know, the dollar collapsing and maybe another dollar coming into place. I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon. I know Chris Ken thinks the same way. It could happen in our lifetime. Maybe not if it, if it transfers out of the U.S. to another uh, federal currency, but we'll see. But the fiat currency versus commodity money. So the move to fiat currency in the U.S., this is how it kind of started. So this is a quick synopsis of how this happened. 1913, the creation of the Federal Reserve and the Fed income tax, federal income tax. Kind of crazy. Before the 1913, we did not have those two things. And yet we were functioning as a country. OK, so that's the first step that happened in moving to fiat currency. And by the way, you guys don't know what fiat currency is. Fiat currency just means it's backed by the government. It's not backed by anything tangible. Before that, it was the gold standard. You could trade a dollar for gold, physical gold. Now you can't. You can trade it for the federal government's promise, I guess. <laughs> you know, it's their promise that it's worth something. That's it. So that's the first step that happened. The second one was in 1933. It was a crime for citizens to use gold as currency. That did happen. It's kind of crazy that it happened. But they were moving off the gold currency. Then in 1944, you had the Brenton Woods Agreement. I won't get into what that means. But essentially, that was moving us further away from money backed by gold. And then, of course, 1971, Nixon moves us the dollar off the gold standard. And that essentially moved the entire world, which was relying upon the U.S. dollar, off of the gold standard. That's a huge deal. That's not even a U.S.-based thing. That's a worldwide thing. That, to me, is phenomenal. It's just crazy that it happened. Yet it happened slowly to the point where I think that people probably didn't realize exactly what was happening at that time or the implications because all of this stuff takes a lot of time to get to where we're at today. So that's some pretty interesting things that happened right there in the last 100 years. But what this did, though, what's very important to understand is that when you moved off the fiat currency, it put the control of the money into the hands of the government right there. That is extremely powerful to understand. Fiat currency puts the control of money into the government's hands. Okay, Precious metal convertibility has been removed, and it was removed gradually, by the way. It was gradually and then eventually permanently. So now it's permanently off that. And now the dollar is backed, or actually the dollar and every other currency in the world is backed by the promise of the governments of the world. So how many of us believe the government is, in the, is doing the best by us? Not many people, by the way, are going to raise their hand and say, oh, I love the government. They're doing the best by me. Maybe that 49% of households might say that, but the rest of us are not going to say that. Yet, here's the deal. They're the ones promising our dollar is worth something, right? That's kind of scary. So what did that do, though? Well, the federal government was now free to expand its power and control because all of the checks and balances against inflation, against money printing, were suddenly removed. So the government's power and, and control suddenly expanded okay now to expand though the government needs money but it doesn't have any money of its own this is very kind of important to realize so where does it get the money well right there from you and i taxes right that's one way that it gets money but what did we mention before earlier before 1913 the federal income tax didn't exist it didn't exist so tax rates were only two to seven percent back then before that 2022 22 to 37 percent. That's a pretty big change. It's pretty staggering. But of course, taxes are not enough. OK, so they're not. So what does the government keep doing? Well, they can't keep raising taxes. They can for a bit like in after the World Wars or during World Wars when taxes skyrocket to like 70 percent. They can do it temporarily. Right. But right now they're actually some people think they're kind of low. Yeah. See, like right there, Chris said, yeah. And that is, oh, well, yeah, that, that was the lowest time in our lifetime right there. Yeah. Back then. So right now. Can they keep raising them? 
Yeah, but people do get upset a little bit, and then they try to find the loopholes and all that kind of stuff. But that's not enough for the government. Even if they raise them, I'm guessing, what, 50%, Chris? They probably wouldn't even be enough to come close to what the government is doing right now. They can't. So what do they do? Well, they do the same thing the governments in history have always done. Now, this to me, when I went back and looked at the Roman Empire, was fascinating. But I won't get into that on this call. But they do this. They create money out of thin air. They create it out of thinner, essentially, right? Now, this is where the Federal Reserve System comes into play and the fraction reserve banking to a degree comes into play. So what does that really mean? So when the government needs more money, what are they doing right now? And now Chris can probably elaborate on this in a lot more detail, but let's just cover it kind of at a high level. Well, the Treasury Department issues bonds um, on the open market, okay? And who's the major buyer of bonds? Well, it's the Federal Reserve. <laughs> Does that seem kind of like a little bit of a circle here going on here? It makes no sense, right? How can they keep doing this? Well, I, I believe they can't. But the Federal Reserve doesn't have a savings of money to purchase the bonds. So what do they do? Well, fortunately enough, they have a printer in their back office where they just go to print out money like crazy out of thin air. So think of it this way. They give an IOU. There's an IOU for the Federal Reserve, the United States, right? For that money, it's just an IOU. They, they, they give an IOU saying, I'm going to owe you money down the road, and they give a bunch of money. That makes no sense. Try to operate a household like that. You would collapse almost immediately, but they don't. So here's the deal. The federal government, the Treasury, knows that it will never have to pay off these IOUs. Okay? So they basically let the government borrow. So the Federal Reserve lets the government borrow new money with no strings attached. That does not make any sense logically when you think about it because you, you can't just keep doing that, right? Now, there is a result of this that we'll talk about, but here, what, what's the catch? So what is the catch of all of this? It's that the holders of the dollar bills, I'll like, I don't have it in front of me right now, but you, me, Chris, Stephen, everyone on the call, the middle class, we pay that cost through the hidden tax of rising prices. And that, by the way, is the true cause of inflation. Inflation is not rising prices per se. Inflation is the inflating of the money supply, which devalues the dollar and causes costs to go up. They're doing it. So it should be kind of obvious right now that it's ridiculous that when the federal government or the reserve and the government pledged to fight inflation, it's, it's crazy they, they pledged to fight inflation, yet they're the freaking major cause of it. They're the cause of inflation, yet they're the ones saying they're going to fight it. Does that make sense? It's crazy they're doing that. Oh, we're going to we're going to do stimulus and all this kind of stuff. Well, the stimulus also caused inflation, by the way, because where did they get the money for those inf those stimulus checks from the printer in the back office again. So they're causing inflation and yet they're doing short term solutions to it that cause even more long term problems. So what's the second major cause of our current financial situation? Now, this is a very interesting one because it's also kind of the kind of the cause of boom and bust cycles in the economy. And that is fractional reserve banking. Now, um, as a whole, this concept is fairly complex, and there's there's a lot of books on this concept about how it came to be. I'm not going to get into those details here because it's <laughs> be here for a long time. Now, and I'm not going to argue the pros and cons of the system either because there are pros and cons to it uh, from, from what I have done in my own research. But what I want to understand at a high level is how it works and how it affects you and me so we know kind of what to do about it or to help protect our money from this situation. So how does fractional reserve banking really work? So, um, by the way, Stephen, do you know, is it currently 10% that they have to have on reserves, the banks? I can't remember what the current reserve is. I, I believe that's right. Although I, I saw something that they were, it's less they have to keep now, but something like that. Yeah, so it's 10%. I know it's been, it's been at zero before, I believe, as well, too, which is mind-blowing. So what that right. means, though, is this. What does it mean? Okay, you, me, Bob down the road, we put a million dollars into the bank. Well, the bank keeps 10% or $100,000 in reserve. Now, it doesn't keep that in the mattress in the back. It actually keeps it somewhere else, but we'll get into that. Now, $900,000 can now be invested by the bank, okay? So original $100,000 came in. Now there's an additional $900,000 in circulation because they only have to keep 10% on reserves. So what they're essentially doing is creating $1.9 million in circulation. Now, that's kind of weird to think that, okay? They take a million in, keep 10%, and they invest or put to work the other $900,000. But they also have on deposit $900,000. But it doesn't stop there. It gets even kind of crazier. Now you have an additional $900,000 circulation. Goes back into the banks. They keep 10% of that. Now it's ninety dollars 810 can be invested by the banks. 
and the cycle tends to repeat itself. So bottom line, what that means is that the banks can take in $10 and loan out $100. Yeah, or 10, 10x that, they can do 10x that. So what does that make sense? So bottom line is this, original million dollars in deposits, the bank, because of fractional reserve banking, can then turn around and essentially create $10 million into circulation, okay? That is pretty crazy. The result of that, <laughs> gluttony of debt and loans, right? So there's more money circulation all of a sudden. There's more debts, more loans, artificially stimulated economy. So when the government prints their money, where does it typically go, though? So they print money out of thin air. Where do you put it? Do you put it in a mattress? Do you put it in your safe? No, you deposit it with the banks who then turn around and create more money out of that money. So it perpetuates the cycle. So this is kind of a, the, the force of the economy into this boom phase. Also, this increases the money supply, which is inflation, which means rising prices, and that growth is unsustainable. And what can end up happening? The recession, the bust, which is kind of on that precipice potentially right now where it can happen. So we're in like this, that, that kind of that preliminary phase right now, right before that big bust. If you ever read the book, The Fourth Turning, kind of crazy where we're at right now. It's a little scary. I have a whole slideshow by that, by, by the way, on that one too. We're in the fourth turning and they predicted what's happening right now to a very high level. It's kind of creepy, but this whole thing just repeats. So by the way, this is not the first time it's happened. It's going to happen again, hundred years down the road, eight years down the road. Very kind of crazy. Yeah. That, yeah. Yeah. Chris, that book is scary. I haven't read the second one. He just wrote, he just released in July of this uh, last year. I want to read that one too, because I heard it was really good and it's even in more, uh, more detail. So yeah. But the result of this guys is the cycle repeats itself. The government keeps getting bigger and bigger and sucking more wealth away. The middle class is poor. Those who are on the inside are the wealthier because they know what's going on. So that's kind of the end of the presentation. But the, the reason why I think this is so valuable is that you have to understand control of money. And how do we control money? How do we get back control? Now, there's another book that Nelson Nash, by the way, Nelson, Nelson Nash is the one that popularized the infinite banking concept that he um, did a forward in. I can't remember the name of it. Chris might know it, but it talks about how this is all happening right now. And one of the best solutions to, to slow this down is to get control away from the government and away from the banking system back into our hands. And infinite banking is one of the number one ways to do that because you can take back control of your money you stop the fraction of reserve banking system from doing this, repeating, you know, basically um, making money out of thin air. It's one of the reasons why I, I got into infinite banking was because of this you know, research right here alone. So hopefully, guys, that makes sense. Um, pretty uh, interesting stuff right there. I know it was very high level, but it just kind of, it's, it's a little scary to understand how long this has been going on. And we're kind of at that point right now where it's, it's kind of getting to a head, I think. So if you guys got any questions on that, um, yeah, I'd love to it. Hey, Brian, I want to hit on one thing with that. I just put it in the chat, but I think it's it's good to verbalize it is, you know, in there you were talking about the middle class and how it just keeps getting smaller and smaller. If you study the middle class, you'll find very easy, very simply, the, the middle class is number one asset from a, a dollar standpoint is real estate. Yeah. So you know, if you look back, if you're a wholesaler in real estate, it's no secret that, you know, I buyers, institutional buyers were buying up houses at prices that weren't really sustainable. And, you know, first it was the Zillow's, but then you, you start hearing about the BlackRock and the Blackstones. And, and when you think about all of those big institutions buying up houses and neighborhoods and better part of, you know, the, the attempt is pretty much to buy the entire city, anything that's rentable is they want full control of that asset class that takes power away from them, which is the middle class. Now, when you look at the whole high arching thing, where do these institutions get their money? Well, go back to the first slide where Brian started explaining all that, and you'll start to see how the circle comes into play. Fed prints it, gives it to the government. Government makes sure that it makes it into the system. Who is the system? BlackRock, Blackstone, Vanguard. Hence why they own everything. It's because it's all controlled by the same mechanisms. So when you think about that, the middle class is being squeezed. And if we all think about housing, it's a necessity. We need a roof over our head but they don't want us to own that house. They want us to rent that house from the institution. So be very cautious on how you view things. You know, a lot of people look at it. And, and also I, I truly believe it's one of the reasons why real estate keeps going up, even though we're in these crazy interest rate cycles. A lot of people say demand, 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 but I think it's more than that. 
the pricing is being held so high by the institutions. And if the pricing dips, the institutions just start the buying spree again. They start buying and they can afford to buy more than any individual can because it's just a balance sheet item. And then the money that's paying for that balance sheet item is coming from all of you because all of you own the mutual funds from Vanguard, Blackstone, BlackRock. Whether you know it or not, you, <laughs> all of us, are contributing to the, the taking away of our control of our money, which, you know, like I said, a lot of that resides in equity and homes. Yeah. So it's one giant circle, man. And it's a frightening thing, which like yeah. you mentioned, Brian, I think you said it probably 10 times in your presentation, you know, take back control of your money. We've been saying it for shoot as long as we've been doing this and it's single handedly become our company's motto and our, our company's mission is to teach people how to take back control of their money by teaching them how to be the bank. Yeah. A friend of mine, his name Michael, he's been buying land as an investment in fast growing communities down kind of in the, well, it's not by Florida, but it's down in that area of the country. And someone just came in and bought 20 lots, one fell swoop, and it was not an individual. It was a large organization. He doesn't know who it was yet, but they went and bought them all out. And he's like, and it just drove the prices up again. And he's like, this is ridiculous. And so a lot of his clients are infinite banking practitioners, by the way, as well, they're taking their money and they're buying these lands to hold on to it. So, and I think the more that we do that kind of stuff, they get control away from those, those corporations, that's powerful. But yeah, they're, they went in there and just actually it was last month, I think it went and bought 20 right off the bat, or maybe it was even more than that. It was crazy. So it's, it, yeah, we're seeing it happening in real time. Yeah. I don't know if you, it, and I, the one thing I love of just about the everything we do and everything you do, Brian, is, you know, it all comes down to banking 101. You know, when we talk about the infinite banking concept and Nelson Nash's becoming your own banker, it's very simple. It's teaching people how to take back the banking function in their lives. I mean, that's the sole process. The sole mission is to take back that control or that process of banking, because that's how you bleed. And that's how you lose control of everything is the banks, you yeah. know, slowly and surely, they're taking control of all of our money and we have zero say in what they do with the money. And then they go belly up and it's game over. Now that didn't happen in the last little round here because the FDIC stepped in and bailed everybody out. And I got to believe a lot of that had to do because a bunch of their good old boys were part of some of those banks. Now, if that were to happen to the regional bank in your town and you had more than 250,000 above and beyond the FDIC limits, I very much doubt your chance of getting money would be good. I, I don't think you'd get anything over the 250,000, but you know, a lot of people have false pretenses and, and that might've been, Brian, now that I think about it, that might've been part of the plan too. Let's, let's trick them to think that no matter how much they have in the bank, it's safe. We're just going to bail them out. There's no way physically possible. The FDIC could bail out all, even just the regionals, forget about the big ones, but just the regionals, they couldn't do it. And a lot of these regional banks are on life support right now. You don't know it, because yeah. of the programs the government came out where they could pledge their treasuries, their securities at full par value, at full market value. And that's all ending too soon unless they, they extend it. So there's so much going on behind the scenes that the average person doesn't know about. And I think a lot of folks on here start asking, well, all this stuff is scary and that, but, but what do I do? And I think that's the single starting place that we always start at is what do you do? Stephen, Brian, you guys want to take a stab at that? I don't want to be the only one talking here well yeah, yeah. I mean, we might, might need you to do a little um do a little uh drawing there chris but uh before we get there did you see that the the fallout from that silicon valley bank failure and the fdic bailing them out the irs sued the fdic yesterday for uh silicon valley's bank's 1.4 billion dollar tax debt so that's something we don't really ever think about you know they bailed them out and then said listen we took over and seized our assets and we're not going to pay taxes on any of this. And the IRS is like, yo, you owe us $1.4 billion. You can't just decline. Um, you can't just say, okay, well, we're not going to pay it and deny the tax claim. So they're suing them now to let a court try and decide. So that's that's something I never even thought about before, but it's an interesting development, right? The tax the other yeah. Go ahead, Brian. No, I was gonna say so that yeah, the, the tax implications, we didn't even think about that. I didn't really thought about that. That's Holy cow. Yeah, that's a big number. Mm -hmm. Another thing that's interesting is, you know, a lot of times when you, you see what happens, you see it from afar, you know, but what you don't realize is when the FDIC bailed those banks out, you know, Silicon Valley, Republic, and there was a couple others that you didn't really hear about, citizens and those, when they bailed all those banks out, that takes money from the FDIC's coffers. 
And if you've researched the FDIC or watched any of the videos I've done on that, the FDIC doesn't have nearly enough money to support the 250000 Not even close. I mean, it's like literally a fraction of a penny for every dollar you have in there. So what they now are doing, and, and talk to any regional bank. I, we have this bank here, Alden State Bank. I've done hundreds of loans with them. I know the, the president. I know the, the lead guys over there. And I've said to them, I said, so what's going on in this, this whole thing? And they said, well, the... You know, the, the regulators are really clamping down on us. We can't do the things we used to. And now our limits, like their reserve limits are being pushed up. Their, their premiums, because they pay a premium for that insurance, are going up. Everything is being pushed up on these regionals, squeezing them. So now they've got to really change the way that they do business, which is going to put a, a lot of these regionals out of business because the way that they did business was being a regional, like they had relationships. So they did a lot of relationship lending, which means sometimes kind of stepping outside of the little box to make sure that that relationship continues. Well, now with all these changes, that relationship box is being destroyed. And it's just like, here's the box they must fit in. And if they don't, the regulator comes down on them. So hmm. Regional banks are not going to really be able to compete with the big institutional banks, you know, the Bank of America's. And, and I got to believe that that's by design, too, because they're trying to squeeze the regionals out so that really you just have the big dogs, the J.P. Morgan Chases and all the, the Wells Fargo's, the big ones, which are definitely, you know, sucking from the you know what from the Fed. Uh, and, and that's how they're all going to survive. So get rid of the regionals take away any controls that that gives to the middle class through relationship banking. And now all of a sudden you're really controlling the entire banking system, which they already do. But just saying that, it just all comes back to how long do you want to just sit back and do nothing and just say, ah, oh, it's going to be okay. I mean, you just do that until it's not okay anymore. And that's, that's the scariest thing that I think people can do. And when you know what the options are and you know what you need to do and you know how simple it is, change one thing, add one step. Like now all of a sudden it just comes down to your mindsets holding you back and you listening to people that don't live the life you want, because that's the biggest thing. Like Steven, this is the thing that pisses me off. So I'm going to rant for just one second is, you know, we know our numbers really well. We do thousands and thousands of IBC policies and we teach thousands of people, if not hundreds of thousands of people, how to take back control of their money. But we get people started a lot of times and they don't make it all the way to the end. And one of the number one reasons they don't make it to the end is because this thing here, your mindset. Yep. People get in your head. And this is where I get so mad and why I do things like the challenge for the strangest secret in the world by Earl Nightingale is because why in the world would you take advice from somebody that is not living the life you want to live? Why would you take advice from somebody that's working at a dead end job, that's always bitching about money, that doesn't, you know, ever like do any of the things that you want to be doing, but yet then they tell you that that webinar you saw, that video you watched, you know, about this banking system using whole life insurance and like, oh, that stuff's garbage. Why would you do that? You're such an idiot. Like, that's the dumbest idea. You're going to lose your money. And you're like, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, maybe I shouldn't do this. And then they don't move forward. They just dodge us. They, they ghost their call. You know, you just took advice from somebody that's never done a damn thing in their life that you admire, not a damn thing to get ahead financially in their life. And they're not they're not where you want to be, but you're taking their advice. You're listening to them. Think of how stupid that sounds. Think, put yourself on the outside and just look into that situation and think of how stupid that person is that's taking advice from somebody that literally has no good advice to give outside of negativity. That's yeah. why when you said half of, you, uh, half of the U.S. is living off of the government, that's why 95% of all the people you will ever come in contact with are not financially secure. I didn't come up with that number. That's Social Security for you. That's why one out of 100 people will be wealthy. As I keep giving you the stats, like it doesn't add up. It doesn't make sense in the richest land in the world, the United States of America, where there's opportunity freaking everywhere. And if you want to get wealthy and you want to get rich, I don't know, I'm 46. This right now is the single best time in history to do it because nobody wants to do shit. So just do just a little bit more. Just, just do a little bit better with customer service. Just do a little bit better of solving your clients' problems and you're going to be stupid wealthy. That's guaranteed. If. You focus on your 
worthy idea, your dream, and you don't let idiots get in the way. You don't let family members tell you your ideas are stupid. You don't let lazy cash tell you you should just be lazy. <laughs> you actually follow your heart, your dreams, and your goals, and you never stop, and you never listen to anybody, and that's going to mean firing some friends. And that's going to mean some hard talks and some hard decisions and some people calling you assholes and people saying, oh, you're stuck up. Own it. I'm not stuck up. I'm living and doing the things I need to do to live my dream. What are they going to say when you say that? Oh, yeah, whatever. That's a stupid idea. No longer a friend. Piss on you. Nix them. You know how I know this, Brian? I've had to do this. <laughs> Growing up, my best friend, Mike, great human being, great guy. I spent all the time in the world with this guy. I don't even speak to him anymore because yep. he was that guy. So when people say, oh, how would you know? Oh, how would I know? Well, I didn't speak to my father for years because of exactly that. I didn't, I don't speak to my best friend growing up because of that. You can call me an asshole. You can say, I'm just mean. You could say, I'm just stubborn. That person got in the way of my dream and there's nothing more important. So folks ask yourself that very question. What's more important? Someone's opinion of you or your dream. I love that. Love it. I mean, that, that it hits home because that was me for, uh, for over 50, no, almost 15 years. You know, just putting my money away, blindly trusting the IRS. By the way, who here believes the IRS has your best interest at heart? Mm, mm, mm. Yeah, me. Of course they do. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, and so, and I asked that question of everybody that I talked to you about infinite banking. They're saying, oh, no way. And I said, do you know what 401k stands for? It's IRS section 401.k or dash K. It's the IRS. You're putting something into a, a vehicle the IRS controls, yet you just told me you don't trust them. So like that does not make any sense. It does not compute. And that's where Chris talked about the mindset right there. It's the mindset thing. Like we're, we are programmed from a young age to do these things, to put our money into the 401k. But I mean, hell, I, you guys know Andy Tanner. So Andy Tanner's a friend of mine, and he has a great book called 401k Chaos. Why does the 401k even exist? It is not for your benefit. It's not. It is for the government's benefit. It is for the IRS's benefit. In fact, guess whose benefit it was originally for? Highly paid CEOs to hide their, their bonuses from taxes. And then what happened? Corporations said, well, wait a second. I love this 401k. You mean that I can stop doing pensions where I'm responsible for their future? And I can make the employee responsible for their future? but they're not gonna be knowledgeable enough to actually be responsible for it. But I can transfer the risk to the employee. Like guys, it's about control. It's about that mindset right there. Like that, that is crazy to me that the 401k is so popular. It's only been around for what, 50 years? I, I have not known anybody who I've talked to who has lived, who has said, I'm gonna live my best life off my 401k. Now, I know people can live well off of them, but I have not met the people that are like, man, I'm living the best rich life off my 401k. Because guess what, they're scared. They're scared of what's going to happen next year, two years down the road. They've seen it drop 50%. They've seen it drop these huge amounts, and they know it's going to happen again intuitively. So control is so powerful. I had a conversation last night with a client. They have 500K in a 401K, $500,000 in a 401K, and they are scared out of their mind right now. Why should you be scared out of your mind with half a million dollars in a retirement vehicle? Because you know that it's not the safest place. That's why. You know that. Mindset right there. But they don't know what to do. Because their money is not in their control right now. They can take it out and pay 30%. Well, that's where they're at. They're going to pay 38% if they take it out. 40% to get control of their money. They work their ass off for that money. That's, bull, that's BS right there. I hate that. Yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty wild because if they still work at that job, like they're not even allowed to do anything with it, like some, yeah. something else. They literally capture it there. Like the control, you give up complete control. It's wild. Yeah. Yeah, and they have they have IRS funds, everything. And they're 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 like just chomping at the bit to turn 59 and a half. Wait a second. You want to be older? Like they want to be older so they can pull the money out as, as soon as possible. But now they're gonna pay, they told me this, they're gonna pay over 20% in taxes when they pull it out. Oh my gosh. And then they look at infinite banking and they said, Holy shit, if I put my money to that thing in the very beginning, <laughs> I'd have more than this and I could not pay taxes on it. Yeah, they're they're uh I wouldn't say they're sick to their stomach, but that was kind of the feeling they, they told me they felt. Yeah. And, and that's the perfect lead in. Like, what is the alternative? You know, what what can we start doing to to change this pattern, to change this tradition that we've just all have always done for our whole lives? How do we, as Chris said before, make that one change that changes everything? 
Breaking news, this just in. Are you sick of having your money lying around not doing anything? Well, we've got the solution for you. PrivateMoneyClub.com. Back to you, Chris. Well, I, I guess, you know, I, I'm visual, so if I may, I just started drawing this, and we're just talking about a circle. Some of you have seen this a hundred times, so you're sick of seeing the circle, but that's all it is. And if you think of the, the sign of, you know, infinite, it just is a loop, and it always just loops. Nothing ever goes out. Well, a circle's the same thing. You know, if something's flowing around a circle, it just keeps going and going. Just look at a hamster. Hamster gets on a, a wheel and just starts running, and it runs as fast as it can, but it never, ever goes anywhere. It just stays within. Well, the same is true for money. And I always like to think, you know, I saw this somewhere, but, you know, disruption is a really powerful thing. And if you can think of energy going back way, way back before we had power, somebody somewhere figured out by standing at a, a, a raging stream or, or, or river, they saw this water flowing. And when they put something in it, they're like, wow, that's a lot of power. And then they're like, well, wait a second. What if we put a circle with a bunch of paddles, drop that down and disrupt that flowing water, that, that power of that flow will just spin this wheel. And if we connect that to a shaft and then we basically figure out how to harness that power, all we've done is we've disrupted the flow of the river and turned that into energy that we then benefit from through light and everything else. So think of that as water. And you all know that to be true, because if you walk out into a stream, it's hard. You know, you're kind of trudging through that stream and running, but you get it down in it and you put your arms out and it's hard, but you're disrupting the flow and the water's got to go around you. Beavers figured that out. Everybody knows how that works with water. Well, do you realize money's no different than water? There is so much money out there. And I mean, well, how Brian just told you, they just keep printing more of it. So there's no lack of money. It's all out there. It's flowing everywhere you go. The one thing you've never figured out how to do is just disrupt it. Like just step in the way of it. Just find a way to disrupt the flow of money. It's such an easy thing to do. And, and that's what I think Nelson Nash really figured out, but he wasn't the first. I mean, probably the Rockefellers, the, the, the Rothschilds, the Morgans, the Stanleys were probably some of the um, among the first to really start figuring this out. And what they, they did is, you know, they basically said, we, we need to create a banking system, a, a fully controlled banking system and they were all bankers so they understood in banking that they didn't have all the control so they wanted to get step out of the banks because the banks weren't as stable just like they aren't stable today and they wanted to create that so you know like forget about what we said about the product because everybody wants to think about the product but just think about the flow of money if you have money and you just want that money to flow around a circle all you need to do is just start connecting the dots i mean all the money that goes out of the source, goes somewhere. Think of this as the paddle, right? This is, this is like the flow of water. This is that paddle that you put in that raging river and that river spins this wheel, creating energy. Well, over on this side, this is what I always call opportunity. Now, all of you have different likes, different things that you know, like, and understand, but all of them create an opportunity. Some of you have a company, some of you invest in stocks, some of you are Bitcoin people. Some of you are real estate people. Some of you are lenders. I don't care what you put over here. Some of you just have debt, which is perfect because that's the easiest place. So all of these are engines. That's all they are. These are just engines that allow your money to work at a higher multiple, a higher velocity, if you will. Your money goes into these things and it spits it back out at a faster pace. Okay, we all know how that works. But when it spits it out, you got to direct the flow of that, that money and put it back to the original source where it came from, which you control, you fully control this. So then it came down to just what's the best source? Where, what is the foundational place where our money should start? Cause that's really the, the baseline, right? Forget about all the investment opportunities. We've done multiple webinars showing different investment opportunities. There's private money club. Let's not talk about the opportunities today. Let's just talk about the starting place, the one change. Because your money has to start somewhere. And I bet you 99.9999% of you start in a traditional bank. But let's just think about how a bank works. Traditional bank, you put your money in the bank, the bank pays you anywhere between 0%. I'm still getting zero. Isn't that pretty funny? I've got too much money in traditional banks amongst all of our accounts and I get 0%. Brian, how much are you getting on your bank accounts? Negative, probably. <laughs> well, yeah, after after they charge you, they try to charge you that $5 statement fee. They try to charge you that $3 service fee. F you. 
we had a rant on that in WTF, sons of bitches. I just had to have Brandon call the bank, which I've had a relationship for the better part of 15 years, about them sneaking in a $5 service fee. I'm like, oh, hell no. I mean, listen, wow. like, do I care about $5 a month? No, but when it's getting charged to me from a bank, all oh, that might as well be $500,000 because to me, it's the exact same thing. Guys, guys relating with that? Are you guys feeling that? Okay, yeah, so man. the bank pays you zero to, let's just say, I'm going to redline this thing. Does anyone here have a bank paying them 5%? Just asking for a friend. Anyone? I don't, but if, if some people had some CDs here recently doing like- No, no, not CDs. Those are, those are tell, terrible. Come on, somebody on here. We got 157 people. All right, Wayne, how much you getting? How much is your bank paying you? Okay, high yield savings, 475. That's fine. It can be a high yield savings. It's a bank. 525. But they control it, yeah. All right, we'll get to that, Tina. I'm just trying to get get to find out, you know, how much banks are getting. <laughs> PMC. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's not exactly a bank, but close enough. All right, so what was our highest here? 5.25? Who said that? So that, that was Wayne. All right, so Brian. Oh, so wait a second, Brian. So you're telling me you're getting 525, but wait, what do you mean your money's got to stay there? Wayne said that. Well, yeah, Wayne said. Yeah, wait, wait. What do you mean your money's got to stay there? What kind of bank account is that, man? You don't have checks? Like your money has to stay there for how long? How long are they going to make you keep your money there? Because, well, as he's saying that, Debbie, you got 475. That's pretty good. And did, let's see, 475. So we got Boyd and Debbie. I'm going to pick on them for a second. Does your money have to stay there, you two, to get 475? Or can you put it in and take it out? Like, let, let's get some folks kind of playing along here. This is a really good exercise. So I want you all to understand some things here. This is this is a false reality that so many people are, are caught up in right now. My son is 525, uh, has checking in and out. All right, Terry, uh, that's the best I've got so far. Yeah. So Debbie can take it at 475. Wayne says, of course, I can withdraw it. We got, we got 525 is the highest. So I'm just going to write 525. Now, let me ask all of you, Boyd, Debbie, Wayne, how much was that same bank paying you two years ago? Is that an LOL that you're laughing at the question? Because I already know the answer. It was probably zero. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly where I'm going, Rick. Nowhere near that, right? I'm sure Boyd said to say the same thing. Yep, 0 0.001. Did, didn't have them then. That's fine, but it was probably zero. So I think we can all agree that this 525 is a very temporary situation. But yet people get comfortable thinking, oh my God, my money's so secure in the bank and I'm getting 525 on it. And I mean, that's great. Until Uncle Powell decides to drop rates, which it's slated that they might do that in March. Who knows? I mean, after the economic report, but they might. If it's not March, it'll be the next one. So when they start dropping rates, what's going to happen? This overnight will go down. Second thing is where we store money, because I know everybody gets excited and they like bragging that they're getting 525 and it's bragging. It's worth bragging because we're used to getting zero for the last decade almost. Like we're getting zero to 1%. So 525, it's worth bragging about. But let me now ask you a question. If if we had $100,000 in that, real, actually, let's go, let's go to the limit. Let's go 250. We had 250 in that bank paying us 525 and we take 200 out to invest in a loan on private money club at 12 because 12% 12 is better than 525, right? And actually at 250, you could get yourself 13% with the Fullers, just saying, not endorsing that. And also I probably should do a disclaimer. Nothing on here is financial advice. We're not giving investment recommendations or advice. We're not financial advisors, CPAs. We're not giving legal or tax advice. Everything here is just our opinion and things that we are doing. That's probably not the right one. We should probably flash the disclaimer. Our attorneys told us we have to start doing disclaimers. But anyway, 13 is more than 525, right? So if you were making 525, you'd probably want to earn 13 on that money if it was fully secured, first lien position, like, like ROI properties would be. And I invest my money with them, just for the record. Uh, not endorsing it, just saying it's pretty freaking cool. So if we took 200 of the 250 out to give it to a, a borrower on private money club, how much would your bank pay you on that? Would you still get paid on the 250 or would they only pay on the 50 that's left? Yep. Stupid question, right? Just the 50. And I know I'm going long on this because I'm trying to drive this home. Yes, you'd get paid on the 50, not the 250. But now if we took the 250 out, you'd get paid on zero. You get 0% on $0. That's how it works. And that's, that's just normal. But what if your bank, your traditional bank, Paid you, not zero, but paid you 5.25% like they are now. You'd love that. 
But what if they gave you a contract that said you, you would never earn less than 3.25% ever? No, even if rates go negative, you could never earn less than 3.25. Would you like that? That'd be pretty sweet, wouldn't it? It's not a very big difference. But but what if they then said, well, but you know what? We're going to guarantee you 3.25, but we're also going to pay you a dividend every year. And that dividend over time has ranged right around 2%. So actually, 2 to 3% is probably higher. So we're going to give you a dividend every year, although we just not, we're just not going to guarantee that. But you know what? Your 525 at the bank isn't guaranteed. So this would be a pretty good bank if they did that, right? So you're going to get anywhere between 525 and 625 on your money, of which 325 is 100% guaranteed. But then this bank said, hey, uh, if you do it properly, we'll allow your money to grow tax-free. Now, I know we got Jimmy on here, who is probably one of the best CPAs out there, although you can't hire him. He's got enough clients. If he's taking on new clients, I'll tell you in the chat. I uh, don't want to you know, say that if he's still taking people on. But you know, you're getting 525 to 625 tax-free. How much would you need to make at your traditional bank if it was taxed to earn the, the taxable equivalent of a 5.25%? Probably seven, right? Depends on your tax rate, but let's just say you'd have to earn 7%. Has anyone gotten 7% on their bank account? Because after the, you, they give you your 1099, it's actually going to be a lot less than 525. So tax-free is pretty cool. But then the bank says, hey, we got another little thing that our bank does. It's pretty sweet. We don't have dumb, dumb suckers, but we got really good Nespresso coffee over there if you'd like a cup. But check this out. We will allow you to use up to the amount you have on deposit at our bank anytime with no questions. You don't even have to apply. You just go online or give us a call and tell us you want a loan. And we will gladly send you a loan for up to about 90% of the money that you have in the account, sometimes even a little bit more. You can just take a loan anytime. We don't care what you're going to use it for. Heck, you can go blow it on, on bad things. Earlier, we were talking about uh, how money gets got squandered by hookers and cocaine. I almost said that, but that's not really appropriate for today. But you can go spend that on anything. Bank doesn't care. They will give you up to the amount you have because they're going to use your bank account as collateral. That'd be pretty sweet, wouldn't it? And then the bank says, but hey, here's the other thing too. You know that loan we gave you? Since we got collateral and since the money that we loaned you we're going to charge you interest. We're going to charge you interest of 5%, okay? Or I don't know, whatever, wherever it is, but that floats a little bit. But we're going to charge you 5% simple interest, but we're going to still pay you interest on the full amount, even when you take all that out, because that's a loan. Oh, and by the way, you don't ever have to pay the loan back. If you want to, it would help you because when you pay the loan back, you're going to be charged the same interest rate on a lower balance. So actually your APR would be lower. So it would make sense for you to repay the bank back to yourself. Oh, and by the way, every payment you make back toward this loan, minus the interest, goes toward your account. So then you just have more money to use the next day. So that's what the bank tells you. And they say the only caveat to that is when you die, what we're going to do is we're going to make ourselves whole. Is that cool? So if you took $250,000 loan and you only had 250, we're going to take we're going to make ourselves whole so your beneficiary will get anything. Would any of you think that you literally died and woke up in heaven and this is what banks in heaven were like? I mean, you probably would, right? You'd be like, "Shoot, I can't tell my friends about this because the more people to hear about this, this bank's going to stop offering all this stuff." Eh, I mean, come on. You would literally think you have found the greatest thing ever and you just kind of carried around and you keep it all to yourself and you never tell anybody about it. Kind of like the people that know the cure for cancer. They just don't tell anybody because there's no money in that. I don't know that to be fact either. So how many of you want this bank account? Because I'll share. Any of you want this bank account? You guys want that? Yeah. I mean, how many of you want this bank account? Seriously. I'm being for real here. I'm not joking anymore. Cash is sleeping, man. I'm not joking. Mm -hmm. You guys want this bank account? This has been around for hundreds of years, hundreds of years. It's always been around, it just isn't called a bank. So we gotta remove traditional bank and we gotta add the terminology that allows your money to do everything I just told you literally to the T and there's even more to it because if you did die, your beneficiaries would still get a lot. Even if you had 250 and you took 250, your beneficiaries would still get something. That bank that I just talked about isn't a bank, it's an insurance company. And it's a product called a whole life insurance policy. 
And yes, that is the only one that works for what I just said, because those IULs, sorry, they don't do that. They put the risk back on you. Those ULs, those VULs, none of that. That buy term invest the difference, Dave Ramsey shit, that doesn't work. Just look at the statistics. It is good old fashioned whole life insurance, but we can design and engineer the whole life to work so that it's a little more advantageous for you immediately when you put money into it. So now, as soon as I say what it is, for any of you that didn't know that I just now told you that it's a whole life, how many of you want it still? I bet you the number is half. I bet you any money, the number, if we really did a poll, a poll would be half. When I said it was a bank, everybody wanted it. When I told you what it was, it was an insurance company and a whole life policy, half of you want it, which is still pretty good. It's about the numbers, folks. Literally, like I used actual numbers. Out of all the people that start with us, they learn about this amazing thing about being their own bank, about all the people that start, only 50% of them make it to the finish line. And I can't help but to ask, and I can't help but to be upset as to why. Is it because we called it a whole life because we're being honest with you? Because what if we didn't call it a whole life? What if we just eliminated that? And we just told you all the good stuff and we just didn't tell you what it was. Number one, we'd get in trouble. Number two, the insurance companies would probably say, we're not doing business with you anymore because you're not being truthful with people. But everybody would want some then. But once you tell somebody what it is, it drops in half. Or their friends come out of the woodwork to say, oh, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. That doesn't work like that. They can't do that. And people believe that shit. People actually believe that it doesn't work the way that it does. But yet last night we did a training for our three-day money school essentials event that we've got coming up March 1st to the 3rd, which all of you should buy tickets today. We'll give you, a, give you a discount and I'll find something cool to give you by the end of this. But out of all those people yet last night that we had on, like almost 30 of them took advantage of that. But that's only 30 out of over 150. So I think a lot of them were like, no, I don't want anything to do with that if it's whole life insurance. Brian, what do you have to say about that? It's a mindset thing. We've been taught, programmed, and uh, led to believe something is not true. Look at who you're around. I mean, honestly, look at who you're around. It, does anybody else around you have these things in place? If the answer is no, then guess what? Listen to somebody else. Guys, listen to somebody else. If you're surrounded by people that have 401ks, you're probably going to have a 401k. If you have people that you know are, are thinking that whole life is bad, buy a term, invest the rest, guess what? That's what you're probably going to do too. But if you're aware of this and knowledgeable enough about this, go get your own knowledge. Make your own decisions. Don't let those things around you influence you. You control this right here. This mind right here is your most powerful thing. Yet the subconscious mind, which is where all your programming is stored, is controlling you. Um, by the way, I, I love mindset. It's one of my big things that I focus on. And so you've got to change the way you think, but you've got to be aware of that. And so I just tell people when it comes to infinite banking, be open, be open to gaining knowledge. You went to college for four years to get a degree. Spend a little bit more time than not four years, by the way, but spend some time understanding infinite banking because it is worth it. Believe me, it is worth it. If I had known about this, I would never have had a 401k or an IRA. I never would have. And my, my situation today would be drastically different because of that. So, but I was taught, I was told, I was actually, in my opinion, forced to into those things. In fact, I was told at one point, Chris, this is pretty crazy. Back when I had a, a 401k, I had an employer, they brought this guy in, the, uh, the, the consultant, right? To go and tell you, okay, here's where your 401k is at. And here's all the selections you can do to all that kind of BS. You've been through that before. You did it before. Mm -hmm. He goes, hey, how come you're only putting in like this much 7%? I said, oh, I'm doing stuff over here in real estate. And he said, what are you doing? I showed him. The guy told me not to put any more money into my 401k. Wow. I'm like, wait a second. This guy's telling me not to do my 401k. So, okay. So I started lowering the amount I put into my 401k. A week later, my boss called me into the office. Hey, Brian, you're not putting money into your 401k. Why not? I said, well, I'm doing stuff over here. He goes, okay. Do you, do you care about your job? Well, yeah. I, yeah, I care about my job. He goes, then I would consider putting your money in your 401k if you want this job. I was yeah. literally told that if I didn't put my money in there, I might not have my job. Are you kidding me? Like that, 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 that carrot, or I guess the, the ax was hung over my head. If I didn't put money in my 401k, I wouldn't have a job anymore. I quit that job one year later, by the way. So Smart, man. yeah, crazy.
as a financial advisor turned real estate investor entrepreneur when I was younger and and then kind of being in the world of kind of how gurus teach and financial education and and, and kind of like the whole seminar world of 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 the industry it really it was kind of like a two-sided thing that I experienced so on one side it was very powerful because I was surrounding myself with people that had a lot of success, made a lot of money, were were very good at what they did as far as entrepreneurship and investing, um, made a lot of really great connections, grew my network, got involved in a lot of really cool opportunities and, and businesses. But on the other side of that, I also would run into and meet people that were a little shady. I don't know how else to say that. There's some gurus out there, and I say gurus in quotes, because they don't really care what they say, that they'll say anything to make a buck. Um, they'll do anything without caring about the client or the student or the person just to make a buck. And so I realized very quickly, like, I don't like that at all. Like I've never been that person. It's just not who I am. And so it, it was kind of interesting being younger to kind of see that and experience it. And it was a, a pros and cons to everything in life. So the pros were, it really opened my eyes to reality. And hey, there are a lot of evil people out there. Just because somebody has a lot of money and appears to be very successful, almost all of them had broken marriages. They hated themselves. They couldn't sleep. They were on drugs, everything else. So the appearance wasn't always the same of reality. So being younger and realizing that it really opens up your eyes and makes you realize, hey, not everything in life is the way it appears. And you have to sometimes look past the surface to really understand somebody or something. And so when I learned about infinite banking and started watching, you know, I had just met you, Chris. Mm -hmm. I had just met Brent. I just started seeing you guys' presentations on infinite banking in 2019. My initial reaction was, this is a scam. This is BS because I thought I knew everything coming from the financial world and, and the entrepreneur real estate investor space. And this was a whole new concept. I just had never been exposed to. So I was like, ah, oh, this is just some marketing gimmick these guys are using. Like, what are they really selling? Like, are they using this to sell some big $60,000 package or whatever? And, you know, as I got to know you, Chris, and got to know Brent and got to know the business, you know, I, I started being like, wow, these guys are actually legit. Like they literally do all this for free with no ulterior motives other than to help people. Now we don't do this for free. The insurance companies pay us to help you design and create these policies and, and banking systems. But that's the cool part is, is that you don't ever pay us a dime and it creates this win-win situation. And that's something I learned back in 2007 in business and real estate, you create win-win situations and that's going to provide you success. So I started to realize infinite banking is built around, this business is built around these win-win situations. And then, so, so I started to really like it. It was like, okay, this is real. Like I can get behind this. I, I really enjoy this, but I still didn't fully grasp infinite banking until COVID hit. And I had more time to really start digging into it, reading the books, watching more videos, really diving into the trainings. And, and that's when it all clicked was the beginnings of COVID. And then I said, all right, well, sh sh th this is awesome. Like I got to start a policy for myself. Um, I started one for myself. I saw how it worked. I was like, I want to, Chris, I want to start helping you do this. Like, so I went out and got licensed and this was all during COVID. Like I had a temporary insurance license because the insurance testing centers in Florida were still closed. Like this was still at the beginning of COVID. Like they wouldn't even let you come in and test. So I had a temporary. And then once they opened it, I remember I had to go in, wear the full mask, couldn't be around other people. You had to be like one person per room. You know, this was like early on. So I was all in once I finally learned about it. But you know, I've, I've said this before at the very beginnings, though, I thought it was like just a gimmick. And, and so I couldn't have been more wrong. But, you know, now that I've talked to thousands of clients, you know, it's funny to hear other people's stories and and first impressions. And, you know, some people have a very similar path where they're very skeptical, whether that's because of other experiences in their past, whether they're just naturally skeptical, whatever. Some people, you know, see it and they're like, that makes all the sense in the world. And within 24 hours, they're, you know, they're, they're all in and they understand it. So everybody's different. Everybody learns differently. Everybody's in a different spot in life. 
but that's okay. I mean, Chris, Brian, how many times do we talk to somebody and it's just not the right time? And then we hear from them one year, 18 months, two years later, and they're like, hey, like I've been silently in the background watching you guys' stuff for the last couple of years. And I'm now in a position in my life where it makes sense in every way, financially, family-wise, everything, where now I'm ready to get started. And other people are like, they see it, they book a call the next day, they're starting, they're going, they're starting multiple policies in the first year. Everybody's different and that's okay. That's what makes all of us unique. And the cool thing about infinite banking and, and these banking systems of being your own banker is it, every one of them is unique. Every single policy we do, every single banking system we design and strategize with, with you over, everyone is different. Everyone is unique. And that's what I love about it because people are unique. So if you're unique, why not have a system built around your money that, that you're controlling that's unique to you and what you want to accomplish in life? And, and so that's just a little background on, on my thoughts on infinite banking. I love it. So let me just explain, like, you know, when I explained the one change, and that is where your money goes first, that is literally still foundational level. That's just literally all we got is a foundation. Like nothing is going to really change in your life by adding the policy instead of a bank account, except for you've got a little bit more interest. It, it compounds uninterrupted. You got a death benefit, which is, hey, you know, I've delivered enough death benefits to know that's a huge thing for your family. A tax, some tax advantages and some protection against judgments and liens and probate. So outside of that, it's just a better place than your bank account, right? But we can all agree that like, that's not the silver, that's not the silver bullet. Like that's not the the one thing that's going to change your life. But what it is, is the foundational piece of where your money should start so that it starts working for you. But more importantly than that, it's the foundational piece where you start to take back control because you're out of the banking system. You're not playing the game with the Fed and the banks. You're playing your own game now. The insurance companies do not operate the same as banks in any way. They don't report to the same institutions. They don't follow the same regulations. Totally different and totally private. I guarantee you, no matter how much money you got at the bank, someone somewhere knows every penny you have in the banks. But I also can guarantee you that I know for a fact that no matter how much cash value you have in the policies, nobody knows how much money you have because it's private and it's not reported, and it's not showing up in all the places bank accounts are. So you could be a 10 millionaire in policies, and nobody would know how much money you have, no matter who they are. Probably the government if they really wanted, but they'd have to go a couple layers deep. That's cool all in itself. But you know what? Now let's talk about how you get wealthy. You don't get wealthy by adding a policy. You get wealthy on the next step. And I started explaining that, but now, I'm going to seal the deal and I'm going to tell you exactly how you disrupt the flow of money. And that comes over here. Debts. We always talk about paying off debts and we have what's called the debt blaster. It is something that we launched. Craig Yenny developed it. It is phenomenal. We can literally show you how to erase all your debt without working harder, longer, or taking on any risk. And all you had to do is change one thing and add what I'm about to show you. And your debt will literally be blasted away. But the best part is, is you'll recapture all the money. You'll recapture all the interest you're giving away. You'll plug the holes in the boat. But so that's a huge opportunity. All right, stocks. I wouldn't say right now is a big opportunity or bonds, but some of you like it. Bitcoin, some of you are going to disagree and say, well, it's at 50 or some thousand dollars. It's a great opportunity. Real estate, I think we all know. More millionaires have been created with real estate and private lending. My God, I mean, can, can I just show you real quick? Like people sometimes, you know, when they're on these webinars, they just don't believe me. So I just pulled it up. Here, I just went into privatemoneyclub.com. You don't need to pay to do this, okay? You can just go in and be a free member. Look at the first two deals, okay? 100,000 minimum, 50,000 minimum, 15% interest on both of these. First lien position, first lien position. Music to my ears because I love Talladega Nights and I love when Ricky Bobby's dad said, son, if you're not first, you're last. I like racing, man. I like winning. How many of you like to win? Put win in the chat. You like to win, right? You don't want to lose. There ain't no second place or third place, man. You want podium, and that is first place. That's what we should strive for. See, a bunch of you want to be winning. So first is important. I like short-term deals, 12 months, 12 months. Perfect. It doesn't put me into too long of an economic cycle. Too many things don't change in 12 months. I'm pretty secure with the next 12 months. 
So I like the time frame. And I'm not just picking on these two. Hell, this one's pretty good too. And this one, 20%, Mr. Duck, great. But like, I want to focus on these and I want to focus on these because I know these deals. I lend money to these people, okay? That first deal, you know who that is? That's the Fullers. For the first time, they've got a deal up on Private Money Club. And if any of you are looking for a great opportunity, what you need to do is you need to be calling or, or sending a message on Private Money Club about this. But people are always like, well, where do you get 15% secured and consistently? And I get a check every single month. Yes, you're damn right. Both of these, you get a check every single freaking month. So there's the proof, okay? That's all I wanted to do. So if you want that, like schedule a call, like get on the phone with Brandon and, and make that happen. But that's an opportunity, right? How many of you are getting 15% on your 401ks mutual funds? How many of you are getting 15% with your high powered, fancy dancy, suited up financial advisor every single year? Are they doing that every year? 15% like clockwork? Nope, they're not. How many of you are getting 15% consistently every single year in Bitcoin? Oh, 15% losses. No, no, no. I'm talking about gains, folks. Gains. How many of you are buying rental properties and every year you're clipping off 15% net income from those rentals? Maybe some of you, but probably not a lot of you because the normal rentals making about 5 to 8%. So 15 sounds pretty attractive. So that's an opportunity. So now let's put this whole thing together. Remember I said the main thing you want to do is take back control of your money by being the bank. So we told you the first step, which is changing where that money goes. Now we got that money here. So let's just use hundred grand because it's simple math. Sorry, hundred grand, simple math. There we go. We know we're going to make about 5.25 to, actually, it's actually higher than that now. It's probably about 5.6, but let's just do it simple. 5.5, okay? Most of them are above 5.6 with dividends. So now we want to take advantage of one of these deals. So we've got our money in that whole life insurance policy, especially designed and engineered, of course. We're going to then take a loan from that whole life policy. And let's just say we want to do that $50,000 deal. Great. We take a loan for $50,000. The second you take the loan, the insurance company is going to start charging you 5% on that 50. And you're probably pissed about that because you're like, man, that's my money. Why are they going to charge me 5%? Stop being silly. They're paying you 5.5. They're giving you 50,000 from your death benefit. So they are not a nonprofit company. They are a profit company. And you want them to be because the profits come into your dividend. The more profits they make, the bigger your dividends go. Play with me here. Like, yeah, you, you like that, right? You want bigger dividends. So you want the insurance company to be profitable. So help them out, man. Throw them a bone. Pay them some interest on that loan you took because it doesn't matter. They're paying you more than they're charging you. So really, it's, it's mood point. It's semantics. So we got 50 grand, we put it over here into that deal I just showed you on Private Money Club and you're gonna make 15%. So hold on, let me just do the math on this one here real quick because I can't do that in my head. Some of you probably can, James I know could. So 50 times 15, that's 7,500 a year. That is 625. So every single month, you're gonna get a check for 625 bucks. And now you've got yourself a dilemma. Yep, the dilemma. You got a new check that just started showing up in your mailbox every single month. And you're just like, oh, wow, 625, what am I going to do with that? Well, the first thing you got to do is when you get a check, what do you have to do with it? You got to deposit it somewhere, right? So you're going to take that 625 and you're going to go down to your local bank that you bank with, get your dumb, dumb sucker, your shitty coffee. You got 625 in the bank. Now, here's my suggestion. Don't stop there because you, you took control of your money. You made your money work on that disruption, you disrupted the flow of money, it spit out $625 a month, 15% interest, and you put it into the bank where they're in control of your money. And you're going to say, uh-uh, not this time. No way. I'm smarter than you, you son of a bitch. And I'm taking your dumb, dumb sucker too. You're going to take and you're going to fill out a form. We'll do it for you for 625. And you're going to send that 625 over here to this new bank, which has your name on it, so this is your bank, B-Y-O-B. Now, it may not actually be a bank location with your name on it, but in your mind, because it's all mindset, you got yourself a bank. So that 625 goes back into your bank. The next day, when that check or that wire or that ACH clears, you now have $625 more to use. While all of your money, all 100,000, even though you took 50, has been earning 5.5%. And here's the best part. We already want the insurance company to be profitable because <coughs> we want our dividends to go up, but we don't want them to be too profitable on our account. So by paying the 625 back to the policy and allowing your bank to benefit, you reduce the loan from the insurance company by 625 a month. 
And what that means is at the end of the year, when they actually calculate the interest that you're going to pay the insurance company, which they already gave you the interest, so you're just giving back some of the money they already gave you, you're going to get back a little less because your APR, okay, whoops, APR is going to be less than five because you're not paying 5% on 50 anymore. You're paying 5% on 50 minus 625 a month. So now all of a sudden, every single year you do this, you are making more and more money in the form of a spread. Because over here, if the spread initially was five, five minus five, gross, okay, it's not actually, I'm just giving you, a, you know, simple math. That was your spread. The next year, your spread goes up. The next year, it goes up. The next year, it goes up. The next year, it goes up. And it's not because the Fed raised rates. It's not because the Fullers or, or whoever, Gunter, pays you more in interest. It's mathematics, folks. Mathematics. Yeah, give Elon a call. He knows a thing about that. Albert Einstein knew a thing about that. Now, what you have done, folks, with all this little chicken scratch, if I erase all this and I just get back to the original thing I said, and that was all we're teaching you how to do is take back control of your money and be the bank, you now 100% control the flow of your money, start to finish. It always ends up back in the same place it started, which is your bank in your control, interest earning in your name. And it just keeps flowing this way. Over and over again, you just controlled the banking functions in your life. If you guys like that, get a hold of Brian and have him walk through your scenario to find out whether or not that will work for you. So Brian, can you put your link up there and you know, let's get some folks on the phone with you so you can walk them through how this would look for them. And secondarily, now that I literally just kind of explained how you can do this and Brian explained the whole thing and Stephen gave you his side of it. I think all of you at this point should pull out, I don't know, a pen. Actually, how about just a mouse? Grab your mouse. I think all of you should buy a ticket to the three-day Money School Essentials event, March 1st through the 3rd. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not asking. I'm actually telling you. Yeah, you're going to buy a ticket. But here's the thing. If you can't be there the first through the third, no problem. We're going to send you all the recordings edited down and broken up into sections. So you're only going to be, you only get what you want. You don't have to watch all three days. And then the, the last thing that I'm going to do is any of you that buy a ticket today, we're going to give you a hundred bucks off. So it's going to be 197 bucks, not 297. And we're going to give you a guarantee. I know you can't guarantee things in life, but we can guarantee this. If for some reason, you decide that you didn't get something out of the three day. If you got the recordings and you thought they just sucked. If I showed up and I had a booger hanging out of my nose and you're like, man, I couldn't watch it. Chris had this big green booger hanging out of his nose. Like, and you just decide that was really bad. It, we will give you your money back. I will put it in writing for you. I will guarantee it right now. This is all being recorded. If you, for any reason, I don't give a shit what the reason is. If you don't like my cat, you don't like Brian. You say Brian should be wearing a beanie because his, he his head is glaring the light and you're just getting blinded by the light. Like you're like, hey, you wanted a beanie. Okay, so if for any reason you want your money back, we will give you your money back. 100%, no questions asked, none. So what do you got to lose? Not only that, speaking of beanies, we'll give you a beanie, a brand new BYOB beanie. They fit really, really good straight out of the snowboard companies. I had this company that used to sponsor me make these because I love the way their beanies fit. So we'll give you a beanie for free. So that's what I'm telling you to do. And we'll take the rest and we'll deliver. I love it, man. I love it. And yeah, the, the three days is going to be a lot of fun. I mean, it just takes everything we talk about and just lays it into a real easy to follow step-by-step -step process from beginning to end during the three days, exposing all kinds of new opportunities, um, you know, because at the end of the day, infinite banking, being your own banker is about controlling your money. Once you control your money, then we need to learn how do we start keeping that money in motion to make more money. And so being exposed to alternative investments, different ways to do that. Um, and that's what the three day is all about. And uh, I did want to mention, I put the um, the registration link, the discount code, virtual discount, all one word, and that'll give you a hundred dollars off. We'll send you the beanie. And then on the infinite banking, though, those of you that do want to start your own banking system and start that conversation, we usually, um, you know, have you connect with one of our BYOB money mentors. But the cool thing about today with Brian being on and teaching 
you know, he he's decided to offer, hey, he'll work with you guys directly. So take advantage of that while you can today. If you're new to this concept and want to start your own banking system, the one thing we ask is just please watch uh, one of the 90 minute videos before you hop on that call with Brian, just so you guys are on the same page, write down some good questions, think about your plan, strategy, goals, what that looks like. So you and Brian can speak intelligently about that and, and have a great conversation. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I'd love to hop on and talk, talk through it. You guys, well, Brian, I thought that was awesome, man. You, I love, I love the presentation. I always love hearing about, you know, the banking system and the corruptness and the bullshit and the nonsense and why yeah. people need to take back control of their money. So thanks for coming on. Awesome, man. Yeah. The more eyes that are open, the more we can get control of it and take it back. And also last shameless plug, I, I, I showed it earlier, but if any of you want to, you know, inquire about, any of those PMC deals, which are brand new on there, uh, you can get a hold of Brandon at chrisnoggle.com or just go to PMC and uh, go from there. You know, just again, just get the call scheduled, make that decision, get on the three day, learn, and uh, get ready to take action because that's what it's all about is learning something and, and putting the, the steps into motion and just taking it one step at a time. I mean, you got to learn to crawl before. You can stand, you got to stand before you can walk, you got to walk before you can run, and then you can take off sprinting and do 100 mile ultra marathon crazy man races. But you start at the start at the very beginning, and that's for every single person ever. And it's the same thing with finances, with with anything, you know, you got to start at the beginning and, and go down that journey. And so anybody you talk to in our network, they'll tell you the same thing that they, they learned a lot. They felt like it was a fire hose. They we're, we're a little overwhelmed, but they just started taking action, picking one or two little strategies to start putting into place. Start with a whole life policy, one of them, and then start adding on to build your banking system for the family. You know, start paying off the debt. Let us do the debt blaster for you. Uh, then let's start learning how to, you know, deploy that capital into passive stuff like private money lending, for example. You know, how to start looking at alternative investing. And all of a sudden you're going to look back a year from now, two years from now, three years from now, and say to yourself, thank God I was on that webinar on Valentine's Day in 2024 because it changed my life. As opposed to looking back and saying, why the hell didn't I buy all the real estate in the world in 2010? Which how many of you wish you would have done that? So we don't want any more of those. I wish I could have, would have. We want to say, thank God I did make a change and did take action on it. And at the end of the day, it's as simple as that. Find somebody you know, like, and trust, which I hope you guys, that's why you're here today. You you start to learn to know, like, and trust us if you're new. And those of you that have been coming on these webinars for years, thank you guys. You're the best. And uh, you guys keep us motivated to go on and do this every single week. And, uh, and if you've noticed, we haven't started doing less webinars. We've been adding webinars to our <laughs> schedules. And so we'll continue to do that as long as we continue to get responses and and demand for it. So appreciate everybody on here. Uh, Brian, thank you for your team. Like I said, you're a wonderful addition to the BYOB Money Mentor Squad and looking forward to everything we do this year in 2024. And really, if you want to take full advantage of everything we do, come out and see us at a live event. We have the Experience Mastermind coming up in April in Orlando, Florida. You can uh, email Shauna at chrisnoggle.com to learn more about that. But that's our... Uh, mastermind we do twice a year and it's all about the experience that's why it's called the experience it's the most fun you'll ever have and we'll spend several days with you and uh, you'll get a lot out of that we have a money take coming up at the end of april and some other events so if you uh, would like to you know you, you like the virtual thing but you really want to get out and hang in person live you know that's really the the cream of the crop there the best of the best uh, come out and see us at one of the events and we'll have some fun with it. So appreciate everybody being here, Chris. Um, I hope Vivi's feeling got, better. Sorry you didn't get to, get to go snowboarding, but it was nice to have you on today. Yeah, Vivi's really sick. So we had to skip the snowboarding trip. But one thing I do want to say, a couple of people were having trouble with the discount code. Any of you that buy, that buy your ticket today, if you even if you pay $297, Shauna will go in just like she did last night and adjust it and refund you the 100 So don't be scared if it doesn't work and you got to pay 297 like just pay the 297 and you'll get a refund from Shauna. She'll just go in and adjust it all. Uh, 
depending on the computer you're using, sometimes we've had some issues with those discount codes, but no worries. We know it's 197. And if you pay 297, you're going to get the hundred dollars back. You have my word, you have Steven's word and Brian's word and Shauna's word and lazy cash's word, right? Lazy cash. That's right. So Ooh, don't move. be scared of that. <clears throat> All right. With that being said, thanks everybody for joining us. We'll see you on the next one, which is tomorrow. Till then. Yeah. See ya. All right, so I hope you guys enjoyed that episode. We're putting up tons of them, but I think if you like this one, you'll probably like that video as well. Not only that, I've got a book that I created, Mapping Out the Millionaire Mystery, where we actually show you what the wealthy do in the game they play with money. I want you to have that for free. And if you wanna know about all my new videos coming up, click that alert button, actually smash that alert button, and you'll be notified every time we put a new video. So we'll see you on the next episode.